Welcome to 2 Peter chapter 3. I can't believe we're at week 48. Uh, it's just counting down until we've had our whole year together. And uh, if this is your very first time uh, coming to our 52 greatest chapters, I'm John Barnett, uh, right over there behind the camera is my wonderful wife, Bonnie. And we're on together, uh, you that are watching and Bonnie and I, on a year long journey going all the way through the Bible using the 52 greatest chapters. Now, I have taped right here in the front of my Bible uh, the, the course plan. Now, if you go to our website, discoverthebook.org, you can get this how to do the study and the complete list of all the chapters, the passages that we're covering. I've just printed those off and taped them in the front of my journal. Now, the, the materials you need for this study, if you're just joining us, you need your own Bible that you can mark in, uh, underline uh, as you're reading, uh, make little notes in the, in the margins. Then you need some kind of a notebook. Just I use a moleskin notebook and I write down everything I find. And we'll talk about this more as we go through this lesson. Um, another resource, and you can read all about this down below in the description of this video. Uh, I strongly encourage you to get your own copy of the MacArthur Study Bible. Now this uh, is the product of the Master's Seminary that worked together with Dr. MacArthur and put all that he's ever taught as he's taught through the whole Bible into one study Bible with 25,000, and you can see them at the bottom, study notes down here. So you have the scriptures with little references down here to the study notes, all kinds of charts and maps and, and uh, introductions and everything. Why this is so important is that for the rest of your life, we are going to all be faced with false doctrine, false teachers, uh, people coming up with the crazy ideas and they say that it's in the Bible and you go, wait a minute, I'm going to be like a Berean Christian. Now, do you remember the Berean Christians? And I'm going to remind you of that writing it over here because that's the whole reason for this course. I want you to be like the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, who examined the scriptures. They checked the Bible to see what they were hearing taught from Paul matched up with the scriptures. Whatever you hear, whether it's here on our channel or whether it's at your local church or reading some book or in the news, always measure whatever you've heard against the scriptures, okay? And, and we're going to sharpen you. And that's our prayer as we go through this, this course. Okay, look down at the slides and I'm going to show you what I mean. We're here on week 48 of our 52-week journey through. The passage we're studying is 2 Peter 3. Uh, here is a clip I pulled off the internet of the end of the world, as scientists would imagine it. But look at this title. God, and the reason we say God is because he's the one who inspired the Bible, explains... And only he can do this because he's the one that knows everything, has seen everything, the end of everything. And what I mean by that is 2 Peter 3 here, this passage that we're covering, uh, think about this and, and just let it soak in that only God was able to give us an accurate record of how the world began. In other words, creation. Only God gives us the flawless, accurate account of how everything will end, okay? Because this is the Word of God. This is God speaking. This is God's truth. This is the inspired record. Okay, back to the slides. God explains the end of everything, and that immediately prompted questions, because when I teach, and Bonnie and I teach in, in uh, Bible institutes and seminaries and classrooms, I always get these two questions. Number one, where is American prophecy? Number two, why is America not in prophecy? Now look up. What a great question. I'm glad you asked those. So I wrote them over here. We're looking at 2 Peter, but immediately this lesson, this week's lesson, which I envision, uh, I'm sitting on this side of the table and, and all of you are, are joining me. You're either at Panera or Starbucks or Chipotle or, or we're sitting you know, in a small group in someone's living room and we all have our Bibles and notebooks and I'm introducing this week's study to you. Now, remember that's how this started, way back. 
Uh, when Bonnie and I were in ministry in local churches around America, that's what we did all the time in our home and, and wherever we could gather people, we taught the Bible. But now the Lord is blessed uh, because of COVID and everyone got used to online meetings. I'm having this Bible study while Bonnie and I travel as missionaries. And so we've just popped into the studio, just got back from 12 weeks on the road. We're here for three weeks and we're leaving again. And I'm sitting across the table talking about Second Peter. And I would look up at you across the table and say, when I talk about the end of everything and Bible prophecy, do you think of these two questions? Because everywhere we travel, this, these two questions are what students come up with. And this is what they say. Where is American biblical prophecy? And if they're not in biblical prophecy, why is America not in biblical prophecy? So I'm going to real quickly, uh, as a part of this Second Peter 3 study, but actually I'm going to divide it. It's going to become a question freestanding on YouTube. Plus it's a part of our small group study. Because so many people have this question. I want them to, to get this biblical framework to understand. Now there's five sobering possibilities of why America is not in biblical prophecy. Number one, we get aligned in with the Antichrist. And, and we are a part of the Western army. That's one possibility. I'll talk about that. Number two, we implode uh, because of everything that's going on with the, the debt in our country, 30 plus trillion, that, that somehow uh, we default or whatever financially and the whole country just kind of unravels or we explode. Have you been listening to news lately? Every news outlet has carried the fact that Russia has threatened the United Kingdom and the United States. You've caught that, right? I'm going to show you a clip in just a minute that I pulled off of uh, a Russian news station where they actually in Russian are talking and saying, if you uh, of Britain and you of the United States don't stop helping the Ukraine, we're going to respond. And it's sobering. Uh -huh. And what they said is four of their missiles, two on the East Coast, two on the West Coast, would completely wipe out about three quarters of the population of the United States. Okay, that's the explode. Or a blackout, we're gonna talk about that. Did you know that one missile exploded at 300 miles up in the atmosphere would make an electromagnetic pulse that would basically wipe out all of our electric transmission lines, all of our generators, all of our phone systems, uh, all of our uh, cell towers that, that we all heavily depend on, plus all the other infrastructure. Want to know something terrible? If the electricity goes off, how do we stop the chain reaction in all the atomic reactors without electricity? They have backup generators, but they only last so long, okay? And then we could dry out. Remember the mega drought that's going on right now? The largest fire uh, right now in our country is, is a byproduct of this drought that's going on in the whole Western United States, and I'll show you pictures of that. So, Where's America? Uh, we'll cover that point by point. Why is America not biblical prophecy? So let's go back to the slides and I'm gonna walk you through this and explain it. Uh, first of all, and this is the, the first lesson that underlines and kind of uh, frames everything. God, in his word, in the book of Daniel, sees only four world empires. Now I know there are many others, but, but now let me explain that. What do I mean by only four world empires? God looks at Jerusalem as the center of the world because his throne, he's enthroned over Jerusalem. They are his chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. All of his oracles come through them. The scriptures come through them. The apostles came through them. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, God the Son, came through them. So God has them as the, the focus of world history. So there are four empires that have had an impact on the people of the land of Israel. And those four empires are how God maps out the history of the world to the very end. So let me show you what I mean on this slide. God sees only four world empires. And we're gonna look at this in Daniel chapter two. Now basically this, God said four kingdoms fulfill his plans until the end. Now I'm not, we've already studied the book of Daniel, you can look back at that, but here are the references if you want to, uh, Look them up right now. So first of all, 
God says these four kingdoms surround Jerusalem and Christ's uh, death, burial, and resurrection. So everything in God's plan is around Jerusalem and the sacrifice of Christ, which happened at Jerusalem. So look at number two. This is the prophetic parameters. This is all Bible prophecy. You have to understand these parameters. There are four kingdoms, all prophecies weave together to that. Jerusalem is the central focus of all biblical prophecy. But look what Daniel 9.24 adds, and the people of the Roman Empire, because they are the people that destroyed the temple. So they destroy the temple, and they're the ones that crucified Christ, right here. So they destroy the temple and crucify Christ. So they're the people of the Roman Empire. And what it says is the Antichrist, the Antichrist is from the Roman Empire. Now that's going to be very important. I'll show you in a minute. And then here's the last thing. If you read Revelation 16 and 19 with Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the final war, we call it Armageddon, has armies that come from the east. Remember the kings of the east, it says in, in Revelation 16, from the north, the kings of the south, but they join the western ruler who is the Antichrist, who is part of the Roman Empire. Wow. So here's, if, if you wanted to see a picture, so Daniel's vision, if we see Daniel's vision with a picture uh, that we can explain, it would look something like this. Daniel 2 says, Babylon is the head of gold. Silver is the torso is Persia. Brass is uh, down through the thighs is Greece. And then iron, the two legs, and then iron again, but mixed with clay are the feet. So basically, Daniel 2 says that there are these four empires with the Roman Empire being the fourth and a revived Roman Empire being the final, but it's still that fourth kingdom. Now in Daniel 7, this is fascinating, when God repeats this vision, Daniel 2 is from mankind's view that, you know, a head of gold and silver, that's all pretty, you know, this statue. But in Daniel 7, they're called these beasts, a winged lion, a bear, a leopard, a terrible beast, a ten-headed beast, which is Rome too. Now let me go a little further. Uh, the gold was the Babylonian Empire. The silver is the Medo-Persian Empire. The bronze of Daniel 2's statue is the Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. The iron, the Roman Empire, the iron and clay, the end times in which we live right now. So the Roman Empire has never ceased. It just morphs. Now let me take you over here to this map, and I want to show you what I mean. Uh, you've seen this map often. This is the Roman Empire, and this is the Mediterranean here. And the Roman Empire is this darkened area all the way around the Mediterranean, plus up here and all the way down. I mean, Rome extended its power as far as it could. So Rome continued to exist right here in the Eastern Empire in Constantinople until 1453. Remember, 1492 was Columbus who sailed, uh, you know, outward exploring the world. Well, during Columbus's lifetime, there was still a Roman Empire. The Eastern Empire here was conquered by the Ottomans. They rose up. They kind of came in from... Uh, uh, outside the Roman Empire as uh, barbarians, and then they overwhelmed the empire and finally knocked it out in 1453. But here's what I'm trying to explain to you. As soon as this Roman Empire ceased to exist, the Ottoman Empire, which is all of this area of ancient Rome, the Ottomans took over all of Turkey, all of the Middle East area, and you know here in Northern Africa. When they got done, Portugal started making a huge empire. I'm going to show you all this. Then Spain made a huge empire. France made a huge empire. And the final empire is right here. The largest empire of all was the United Kingdom or England. Now look back at the slides and I'll show you what I mean. Look at these statistics. You can look all this up on Wikipedia. The Roman Empire was 5 million square miles. 
So million square miles, I abbreviated as MSM. It declined in the east. The Roman Empire started in 746 on the peninsula of, of what we call Italy, and it continued till it was overthrown by the Ottomans in 1453. So there's the Roman Empire, basically, of what Daniel talked about, this massive iron two-legged, you know, that's both sides of the Mediterranean, north and south, northern Africa and Europe, basically, were the two parts of the Roman Empire. But look, it didn't really cease. It morphs. What happens to the Roman Empire? It becomes the Ottoman Empire. 5.2 million square miles are ruled as, as a part of what used to be the Roman Empire. Then it became the Portuguese Empire. They ruled 5.5 million square miles. Look at that, for 400 years. The Spanish Empire, huge, 5.3. Look at this, for over 300 years. Uh, that was one of the great empires of the world. The French Empire, 4.4 million square miles, only about 100 years. Then we know so well the British Empire, which was the biggest empire the world has ever known, reigned for over 200 years. Look at this. 13.7 million square miles. So it just morphs. Every piece, see this is the Roman Empire. Every piece of the Roman Empire had its day, we could say, in the sun. But look at number seven here. America was a part of the British Empire. And it's now the current world power since uh, right after World War I, when Britain started to decline and the, the uh, colonies started breaking off, America ascended and we're still the, the global superpower. So, back to this map, all of this is the Roman Empire. This Eastern Empire fell, became the Ottoman Empire, then the, the Portuguese Empire, then the Spanish Empire, then the French Empire, then the United Kingdom. Each piece had its day in the sun, but it never ceased to exist. So now let's look at the possibilities. What happens to the USA? Well, five sobering possibilities. We could align ourselves and become part of the revived Roman Empire of the West. Here's a picture. You can get this. This is this, is this year's NATO. You hear a lot about NATO, right? Uh, you know, this is uh, the Ukraine right there. And of course, this is Russia. All of these bluish, all of these nations are somehow either applying or part of NATO. And look, the only thing that isn't a part of the old Roman Empire is right here, this area. So it could be that America, through NATO, through the revived Roman Empire, aligns itself, see, to become part of the revived. That's Roman Empire II, as you saw. Remember, uh, there's the first kingdom, the second kingdom, the third kingdom of Daniel, the fourth kingdom is Rome, and Rome part two is the revived Roman Empire, which could be we align, and that's why we're not in prophecy, we're part of the Western Confederation, the Antichrist kingdom. Number two. We implode financially. Now, just a second, look up and think about this. Uh, we've gone through supply chain crisis, the cryptocurrency explosion, and, and then implosion, you know, all the cryptos have dropped, the stock market has dropped, the real estate market exploded during COVID, and then now the, the real estate market is starting to decline. Now we're having all kinds of inflation, gasoline, heading toward $5 a gallon. Uh, I can't believe I was going through our family pictures, looking at them on the phone, and in the background of one of the pictures, it said $2.50 a gallon. And I thought, where's that? I want to go get some gas. It's before our eyes, we're seeing this, this incredible global financial distress. Look back at the slides. What could happen to the USA? Well, we owe more money than than most of the rest of the world combined. Financially, because of our $30 trillion debt bomb, it could cause different parts of the United States to default. Uh, it could cause some kind of a disruption uh, for us to stop being powerful. So an implosion. 
uh, I call it the U.S. public debt $30 trillion uh, debt bomb. It's kind of like waiting to explode and cause uh, severe financial trouble. Here's the third one. We align, we implode. How about America just explodes? Did you know Russia, June 1st, uh, just a couple weeks ago, Russia is threatening the United States. And what if they stop threatening and actually do what they say? They said if they launch two to four of their Sarmat missiles, they would wipe out the United States. This is actually, look, this, this I clipped out of the online news. Update, Russia, this is June 1st, 2022. And, and it wasn't the first time they said it. They've been saying since the Ukraine war started. Russia threatens to wipe out the USA with just four of their Sarmat code in America uh, and Western Europe. They call them Satan nukes. The real name, you can look it up online, is Sarmat. Named after Sarmatia, which is a part of the Ukraine, which is a part of ancient Russia. And so they say... Each of their missiles has 15 uh, separate guidable missiles within the main gigantic missile. It's hypersonic. Each one of those is 100 times powerful, more powerful than Hiroshima. So in other words, the, there would be 15 of these warheads uh, on each missile. If they did two missiles, they would put 30 explosions like this down our eastern seaboard and they would shoot two more and do 30 explosions uh, you know, across the western seaboard and they said they can wipe us out. Wow. Now look, look at this next one. Over here on the right, this is what I clipped off of the Russian TV station. Watch this video clip. What he's saying is they could send a nuke to wipe out uh, the UK or they could send one of their underwater drones here to explode underwater and tsunami the United Kingdom. Now, that's unbelievable that they're saying that on television. So it could be, number one, America is aligned with the revived Roman Empire and we're part of the Antichrist plan. We implode financially and kind of just, you know, kind of fade out because we can't afford anything, even food. Or... Russia or China or someone else actually launches atomic missiles at us. How about this? This is maybe, this is very possible. Under an EMP strike, China could do that today. North Korea could do that today. Russia threatens it. Iran even could do it. What, what does it look like? Well, if you detonate a thermonuclear explosion in the atmosphere 30 miles up, it would cover this much, the United States, a 480 mile blast radius. If you detonate it at 120 miles up, it's a thousand miles that it fries all electronics, transmission lines, cell towers, hospitals, nuclear reactors, even the circuitry in our complicated cars. Look at this, at 300 miles, which is just a, a satellite height, it covers the entire United States. A, a, a EMP pulse would be 1,500 miles wide from 300 miles. That's the coverage of just one strike, one little EMP strike. And those, by the way, all those drawings are from the congressional hearings. They've been having hearings on this for 20 years because we've known this could happen. So what could happen? Five sobering possibilities. Here's the last one. We could dry out under the 1,200-year mega drought we see unfolding in the West right now. I mean, we don't have to join the Antichrist. We don't have to go broke financially. We don't have to get attacked by atomic weapons or, or face a blackout. We can just dry out. We're facing right now in the Western United States where, uh, you know, one-third of all of our vegetables come from right here. Uh, so much of, of America's population is being totally affected by the Colorado River waterway. It's drying up. L look at this, this is a typical example. You can see Lake Powell, Lake Mead, and every other reservoir between the, the headwaters and down here in the Gulf of Mexico are drying up 
And this is last year's uh, picture. You ought to see how bad it is this year. So where's American prophecy? Uh, or why is America non prophecy? Look here on the board. There are five possibilities, and they're, they're very sobering. Uh, we can align with the Antichrist to be totally godless. We could implode financially. We can explode with atomic attack. We could have an EMP or just the drought, just a series of mega climate shifts. Can you imagine if the drought hit the central United States, the Ogala Aquifer, and we couldn't grow corn and wheat? Did you know there, there are three main crops that feed the world, corn, wheat, and rice? And, and if we have any hit on those, we're talking famine, okay? So, so you say, what is this, trying to scare us? No. God explains the end of everything. And God tells us, now, now see, this is the whole reason we're studying 2 Peter. God says, what lasts forever, and how does that shape your daily life? When I spent my week, and I've, I've already done this class, I'm introducing it to you, but I've already spent all week long reading, reading, reading 2 Peter and putting into my journal everything I found. And basically what I came up with is, if God shows us what lasts forever, it should shape my daily life. I should start living for what's not going to burn up and, and dry out and, and get EMP'd. Are you floating or rowing? We're going to look at godly living is a struggle. But here's the real application. And for those of you that are just tuning in for the Q&A on is American prophecy and if it's not, why? Here's your application, okay? When it feels like the end of the world is near, what are Christians supposed to do? Dig a kind of a, a cavern to hide in and store food? Is that what we're supposed to do? Get as far away from civilization as possible? Is that what we're supposed to do? Live off the grid? That, that, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this, when you feel like the end is coming, live redemptively. We're going to study that in this course in just a couple of minutes. Stay alert so that you see God's word unfolding. Build fireproof. Invest your life in what you can never lose. Your true True net worth is what can never be taken away from you. And that's what God explains to us. Look up. We should be looking up for our redemption draws near, and we should be the most hope-filled people on earth. We should be the ones that are peaceful, calm, not living in fear, not living in anxiety, not living in constantly, you know, wondering if something's going to happen to us. God said, I'm holding you in my hands. I am holding the future. I hold your life's breath. I know every day of your life. I know what you need. And I will bring you through or take you home. And taking you home is even better than being carried through the, the struggle. And finally, as Second Peter ends with, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Obey Jesus experientially know how to obey and follow him. So that is, is the answer to, to these twin questions. Where is American biblical prophecy? And why is America not in Bible prophecy? There are some very sobering possibilities, okay? But rather than focus on fearing those things, live redemptively, stay alert, build fireproof, look up, and obey Jesus. Now let's go back to the slides. So that's the answer to where is American prophecy? and why America is not in prophecy. Now let's move on to week 48 of our 52 greatest chapters, 2 Peter 3. The big picture is God in this chapter is explaining to us the end of everything. Literally, it says that. Here, look up and I'm gonna to read to you how the Bible describes the end of everything. Just take your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3 and it says, starting in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, everything, look, look at the slide, the end of everything, the earth and everything on it is going to be dissolved, and so is the universe, okay? That's what Second Peter says. Now, next slide reminds you where we are. We're on week number 48, right here, 2 Peter 3. We're going through the 52 greatest chapters. 
We're going to see there's a new universe. We're going to see what survives forever. And God explains why it lasts forever. This is an exciting week. Now, what you've joined is a survey of the whole Bible by the 52 greatest chapters using the devotional method. Uh, I haven't shown you all the tools. Here is another suggestion from down in the description of this video. For studying uh, the whole Bible, you might need a theological framework. Now, I do read uh, many of your comments, and, and some of you are saying, wait a minute, Grudem, systematic theology, isn't he reformed? Yes, he is, very reformed. And some of you said, uh, John MacArthur's study Bible, isn't he reformed? Yes. Do you want to know the simple difference between reformed and non-reformed, uh, which would be Arminian? Basically, it's the conflict between Calvinism and Arminianism. Calvinism says that if you are saved by God, you can never lose your salvation. Arminianism says that you can sin and fall from grace and lose your salvation. That is the big picture difference between Arminianism and Calvinism. Which one would you like to hear from? Someone that affirms the security of your salvation or someone that, that believes you can lose your salvation? Well, the good news is in Wayne Grudem's systematic theology, he actually covers all the beliefs of all the groups. Uh, here, I'll, I'll show you, and I don't usually show this to you, but here in the front, they, they cover everything the Episcopalian Anglicans believe, the Arminian Wesleyan Methodists believe, the Baptists, the Dispensationalists like Dallas Seminary, the Lutherans like Martin Luther, the Reformed or Presbyterian like the Calvinists, and the Roman Catholics, and both pre and post Vatican II, and the Renewal Charismatic Pentecostals. So basically, if you have a systematic theology like Grudem's, it is, the writer is very reformed, but he explains what the whole spectrum of Christendom believes. That is so important, so we know what we believe. And what he'll show you is, this is what the scripture says, just like the MacArthur Study Bible gives us, and then you, remember, being a good Berean, you will say, ah, I understand now why there's different groups, they see things differently, but I know what the Bible says. Okay, back to the slide. So we're surveying the whole Bible. We're using 52 of the greatest chapters. These are representative of the whole, but here's the key. We're using the devotional method. And what we do in our journal, remember our journal? Right here is my journal. And I'll open it up to show you this week where I studied with you. Second Peter 3, you can see I write it at the top. This is all, everything you see written here is what I'm going to be covering over here with these lessons. Okay, those are right out of my journal, typed out for you. Okay, back to the slide. You write your own title, and you've seen mine, it's on the board. Uh, you know, uh, God explains the end of everything. Then you write down all the lessons you can find, and I've shown you those over there on the sideboard. But look at this, you write an application prayer. And I'm actually gonna end our session reading that with you. Okay, uh, here's my Bible. Um, and what I have in my Bible is I've written down, this is where we are. We're right after the fire in Rome. Nero is persecuting the Christians and Paul and Peter are gonna be martyred. So second Peter is just before Peter's martyrdom. Uh, he is on his way. Uh, toward going to meet the Lord, being crucified upside down. And so in my Bible, we're looking at something that's occurring right here in the late 60s. And I've jotted that in my Bible. Now, here's everything that I've taken in my journal, okay? I titled the top of the page, week 48, 2 Peter 3. Then I write my own title. Now you say, how do you do that? Well, it's just whatever you can summarize you saw in that chapter after reading it. And each time I read it, I write a new title. And this, this time through, I wrote what lasts forever and why it lasts forever. And then does God shape my daily living? Here's a summary. God uses 2 Peter to get them ready for the reality of death. That's 2 Peter 1. The Deception of False Teachers, that's 2 Peter 2. See, I read the whole book of 2 Peter. 
although our focus is right here, but I want to see the big message. The end of days is what we're covering. But 2 Peter has such a lineup of biblical doctrine. Um, and, and first and second Peter, last week we did first Peter, is an amazing pair of epistles. And I hope that you're enjoying studying them. Now, now here's more of my summary. Peter never forgot. As we open to 2 Peter 3, we're opening to the final session Peter had with the growing churches he poured his life into. They're now scattered across the heart of the Roman Empire. Now look over here. I want to show you on this map where Peter's writing. In 1 Peter, we saw this. To the believers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia. There's Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So see, this area, what we would call modern-day Turkey, is the area that, that is the heart of the Roman Empire. Remember, the empire slowly starts being overrun by pagans, by what they called, uh, you know, the, the hordes, the, the, uh, like the Germanic tribes and the Franks and the Visigoths and all these were all coming across like this. And this part of the Roman Empire is what remained till 1453. So it was the heart of the Roman Empire. Back to our slides. Uh, they're scattered across the heart of the Roman Empire. They're facing fiery trials. We studied that last week in 1 Peter. And glittering allurements. They're torn between loyalty to Christ and painful persecutions. Either they're floating along. Remember I told you like floating in a canoe down the river with the current of the world and its endless pursuits. And so they either are going to go through painful persecutions or float along and, and not buck the culture. Peter's congregation sounds eerily like the church in America in the 21st century. So the, the question is, are you floating or are you going against, fighting against the current, paddling or rowing uh, your canoe like we talked about last week? We either float along with a crowd that lives for the weekend, parties, and fun, or we live every day as sacred to Christ and suffer. We float along with the world uh, as believers and enjoy as much as we can of both worlds. See, that's what our world is facing. And this is when I would look up and I would say, and I always, all those small groups I have, I always stop, I take my Bible and I say, wait a minute, look up everybody. Think about it. You and I, when we were born, were dropped into the world, flowing away from God. The whole current of culture and humanity is in rebellion against God, going away from him. When we got saved, Jesus saved us, and it's like he put us in a canoe and pointed us toward heaven. And he said, all of the world is going this way toward destruction, you are going toward your father's house. And sanctification is me resisting the current and paddling against it and resisting the way I was born with my sinful desires and habits and all the things that I was born with. God says, I want you to be born again and get a new heart and a new spirit. So my question to you is, are you floating along with the current today or are you paddling against it? The grace of God, Titus 2, 11 to 13, that brought us salvation teaches us to deny, to paddle against ungodliness and worldly lusts. Okay, back to the slides. I don't look across the table and, and uh, make you feel bad too often. Are you floating along in the river of materialism or are you fighting against its control of your heart, mind, and will? That's the proof of who we really serve. We try and stay focused on the Lord, especially on Sundays, but so much of our life gets consumed with things, activities, and pursuits, so it's hard to focus on God. Jesus said it's hard to follow his path, and Peter agreed. Last time, last week, we looked at 1 Peter 2-4, to and we saw that godly living was really a struggle. The empire's greatness was clearly seen. Those huge temples we talked about, uh, the sprawling bath complexes that could hold thousands of bathers, the crowded athletic stadiums, the acoustically perfect theaters, the bustling markets of Asia. We can see that very little has changed from Peter's day to ours, and God's word speaks so clearly to our lives as it did to theirs 20 centuries ago. 
And that's the power of the supracultural timelessness of the scriptures inspired by God. So what are Peter's lessons? Well, Peter targets the people with a reminder that all of our homes, our cars, our collections, our gadgets, our trophies, our treasures, our investments, and anything else material face a future of fiery destruction. Remember, that's what we already read. And so, this is what I showed you on the board, when it feels like the end was near. Look at this. As Peter was writing to his epistles, those early believers, at times they felt like maybe the end was right then. They thought that the, the Roman emperor was the Antichrist. Many of them thought they were in the tribulation. That's how the church has been. It's been so bad. In his first epistle, Peter comforted them about fiery trials. We studied that last week. Now he assures them that it's only going to get worse. And everything is going to go until it's finally consumed and all things are made new. That's what we see in 2 Peter 3. So Peter lays out for them and for us how we serve the Lord to the end by five choices with these five lessons. Live redemptively, verses 1 to 9. Keep alert. Build fireproof. Look up for Christ. Obey Jesus. Why? Because our culture, materialism, blurs our purpose in life. Uh, Think about it for a second. Why are we here? Our purpose in life is not to have the most financially secure job, career, education, lovely you know, surroundings. That's not our purpose. Materialism blurs our purpose. The Bible has written down for us of what we're to be as disciples. And that's what the first nine verses are about. Secondly, materialism clouds our minds. Why? Because it's so easy to get involved in the idolatry of, of covetousness. What's that? Oh, looking online and wishing I had a better kitchen, a better car, better clothes, better, you know, electronics, a, a better everything. I mean, we, we start having the idolatry of covetousness. By the way, what is, what is idolatry? If the Bible represents God, idolatry is anything that takes God's place and pushes him out of the way. It can be our job. It can be our family. It can be our education. It can be our entertainment. It can be anything. Idolatry is something that robs God of being foremost in our lives. Okay, back down to the slides. Materialism clutters our lives with discontent. It blinds our eyes to, with earthly treasures, and it corrodes our wills because we want to serve two masters. Okay, let's go through the lessons. Now, these I'm going to quickly go through these. Uh, you can see them over here. This is what I wrote in my journal, and I'm going to show them to you typed out in just a second. But in uh, 1 Peter 3, let me get there with you, and my page is getting loose. Uh, first, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3. Beloved, I write to you the second epistle to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. He says, I want you to respond to God. You say, wait a minute. It doesn't say that. Do you remember what the lessons are? The lessons are we take our journal and after reading that verse, we write down what we see the message is from God in that verse. And what this verse said is, I want to stir you up your minds to remember what God has to say. So I wrote, God wants us to be stirred up to to respond to him. That's why he speaks to us. If someone speaks to you, they would like a response. And God says, I want you to respond to me. And then uh, look what it says in verse three, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. Expect scoffers. Uh, Verse four, saying, where is the promise of his coming? Uh, everything continues as it was from the beginning. We call that uniformitarianism. And it says they fail to, to remember about the flood and about the, you know, all, these are all scoffers rejecting what God says. And so look at verse five. For they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and the water. You know what that is? Affirm your creator. Believe that God created everything. Remember verse six. Um, the world that then exists and perish being flooded. Remember the judge. God says, if, if you reject me, be not deceived, I'm not mocked, whatever you sow, I'm, I, you're going to reap that. And Jesus said he is the judge. 
So remember the judge, escape the fire, see verse seven, the heavens and earth are preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire. So everything it's possible to get out of the fire. In other words, send our treasures to heaven, take people with us to heaven, invest our time uh, for the Lord. That's escaping the fire. So it won't be burned up. You know, most people in this world have spent everything getting the best they can have on earth that's going to be destroyed. And they haven't even ever looked up and said, this world isn't where I'm going to be forever. There's an afterlife. How do I invest in God's plan and kingdom and what it lasts forever? So, okay, back to the slides. Uh, here are the lessons, and I typed them out for you. Respond to God. Trust God's word enough to listen to him and respond. That's why we're doing this study. Expect scoffers. Uh, they're, they're going to say, oh, it, you know, the Bible isn't true. Resist Satan's lies, especially this uniformitarianism, that there was no global flood and there's no judgment coming. Affirm your creator. By the way, when God presents the gospel at the very end in Revelation 14, he says that, that worship the creator. Remember the judge is coming and we've, we've covered this so many times in the Gospels. And then I put in for you, see this MSB right here? This was a great note from your MacArthur Study Bible. I wrote my sixth uh, lesson I found is from verse 7. I'll read it to you. It says, the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word. What is that? The creative word. Jesus spoke. He's the creator. Colossians 1, 15, 16, 17 says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. He is the creator. And by his word, the heavens were of old. He spoke them into existence. And they're now preserved, verse 7, by the same word, reserved for fire till the day of judgment. Remember that we can escape the fire. Now, now look at this note. This is what the MacArthur Study Bible said. God put the rainbow in the sky to signify who would never destroy the world again by water. That's Genesis 9. In the future, God is going to destroy the heavens and earth by fire. That's what it says in all these cross-references. The present universe, the heavens, are full of stars, comets, and asteroids. The core of the earth is filled with flaming, boiling, liquid lake of fire, the temperature that re reaches about 12,400 degrees Fahrenheit. The human race is separated from the fiery core of earth by only a thin 10 mile thick crust, kind of like the, the skim uh, on top of uh, heated milk in your hot chocolate. We're sitting on that above that fire. Far more than that, the whole creation is a potential firebomb due to its atomic structure. As man from Adams creates destructive bombs that burn the path of death, God can disintegrate the whole universe in an explosion of atomic energy. So uh, escape the fire by fleeing to Christ. And that's what the seventh lesson I found is seek the Savior. Now, listen to this in verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Look at this. Seek the Savior, the one who, who is long-suffering, and he's not willing that any should perish. Live redemptively. Take people with you to heaven. Number nine, uh, live for eternal things. Let me read to you verses 10 and 11. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt. Verse 11. I love how Peter does this. Peter was an apostle. Uh, one who really liked to apply the word of God. And he, I can just see him looking at his congregation and say, since all these things, verse 11, are going to be dissolved, what kind of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Can you see his heart poured out by the power of the Spirit of God writing these words? Now look at the slide. This is my lesson that I wrote in my journal. Live for eternal things. God said, we keep our lives from suffering loss, from having the legacy of our life destroyed, number one, by living for what lasts. What's that? Verse 10, uh, what we have that won't burn. And by living for what pleases him. That's verse 11. So we won't be ashamed when he shows up unexpectedly. That's what empowered the early church. They were looking for Christ every day. 
Uh, by the way, what is Peter thinking about that displeases God? See this? L look at verse 11. Um, what manner of people ought you to be in holy conduct? What he's saying is, don't, don't do what displeases the Lord. Well, what would displease the Lord? Let me show you. It, years after Peter, we find in 1 John, the last living apostle uses the very same word Peter was instructed to use. It does not please God for us to crave and sacrifice for what he's telling us to abandon. What does God say we're supposed to abandon? John writes it in 1 John 2. This is the verse. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Uh, Peter said, since everything is going to be dissolved, don't love these things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and this is what I wrote, uh, and we're going to be doing 1 John next week, but I'll give you a preview. The craving of our body chasing pleasures. The lust of the eyes. The lusting of our eyes chasing stuff. The pride of life. That's the boasting of our mouth chasing status. Most people are either chasing pleasure, chasing stuff, or chasing status, or all three. But none of that is of the Father. It's of the world. And look at this. The world is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. What pleases God is when we live, verse 11, purely. Verse 12, let me read it to you. It says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. We live expectantly. And then look at number 12 on your notes. We're supposed to live hopefully, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved. That's verse 12 right here. And look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promises, we're to live hopefully. We live by his promises. We're looking for new heavens, new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, there was never a more relevant passage for any group of people than those at the heart of the Roman Empire in Peter's day and us at the heart of American of materialism today. So Peter's saying, this is how you build a de destruction proof legacy. If you know in advance, everything around you is going to get dissolved like trash in an incinerator. Peter's saying, what should we focus on? In other words, 2,000 years ago, as they thought they were in the end of the world, Peter said, what on earth are you living for? Peter heard Jesus warn him that materialism or the craving after the, riches, the things riches can buy, number one, enslaves our hearts. Uh, Look with me in Matthew 6, okay? Matthew 6, so go back in your Bible. We covered this so long ago. I want to stir you up by reminder. That was Peter's motto. He said, I want to stir you up by way of reminder. He repeats himself. But look at 619 of the Gospel by Matthew. It says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. By the way, the word lay up, it's the word that we get the, the idea of a thesaurus. A thesaurus is, is multiple words kind of grouped together to give wider meaning. Thesaurizo means to stack a lot of stuff. Whether it's words, thesaurus is how we use it, or thesaurizo in Greek means to stack treasures. Now think about it. Jesus says, don't stack up for yourself treasures on earth. Why? Moth and rust destroy. Thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Look back at the slides. Riches can enslave our hearts. Why? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Then it takes captive our mind. Look what it says in verse 22. Let me read you Matthew 6, 22. The lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, what is a bad eye? It's an eye that's only looking for more stuff, looking for more status, looking for more possessions. That is, is a bad eye. It's, it's blinded from looking for heaven. Now, let's see, we're week 48, 49. When we get to Revelation 50, 51, 52, I cover in depth how the early church, especially in Laodicea, were blinded because their eyes were only looking for things on earth rather than things in heaven. Okay, But back to, to uh, 
chapter 6, uh, the last one in your notes, it says in verse 24, it conquers our will. I'll read that to you. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon, materialism. Okay, back to the slides. Either we lay up treasures in heaven that can never be lost, or we clutter our life on earth with things and lose our treasures in heaven. There's no middle ground, Jesus said. We can't serve two masters. So Peter is asking them and us, should we spend our lives collecting and guarding, seeking out and holding on to trash that will only be taken away from us by God and burned? And you can review what we studied a few weeks back in 1 Corinthians 3. Or spend our lives on eternal treasures that last and stay with us forever so that we can give an endless offering of worship to God. Which are we going to do? Before we go, we need to say something as a response to God. And this is when I would look up at, at you. And so I'd say, hey, there's an old hymn. And, and I'm going to quote the words for you, okay? This is an old hymn that we used to sing in the hymn books. Growing up, I knew this by heart. Here's how it goes. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Worldly treasures all forsaken. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Now look down. I printed it out for you. Uh, I was quoting uh, a combination of the stanzas, but my favorite is the first. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him, in his presence daily live. Look at this. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Look at this. Please ponder these words. And, and even hit the pause button right now. And look at the screen. And right where you're sitting, why don't you pause Look up at the Lord and say, Jesus, I want to surrender. I want to freely give what time I have left on this world. Some of you are young. You've got a whole life ahead of you. Some of you, I hear from you, you're old. You have one foot already in heaven. You say, I just want to, I want to live in your presence every day. I want to love you more, trust you more, and surrender more of my life. You are my Savior. I surrender all. Pause and make that offering of response to God. And we'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Here are the last two points. This is the 13th lesson I found. Live peacefully. Let me read it to you. Uh, let me get back to 2 Peter. My pages are loose in this Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3. And let me see, I'm going to read verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom, has written to you. And, and on and on he goes. So look at the slide. Live peacefully. Live peacefully. Be diligent to be found at him in peace. And then he says, live fruitfully. Grace is what God does. Knowledge is what we do. Let me read to you the last two verses. Look at verse 17. Therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked. But grow in grace. That's what God does. And knowledge. That's what we do. We seek to experientially know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Grace. It's what God pours on us. Knowledge is what we choose to experientially know. How do we do that? By applying the word of God to our lives. How do you apply the scriptures to your life? Let me just show you one way. Here's my prayer. Look down at this, this slide. After spending all week long on this, this is what I wrote today. I actually wrote this today. And and uh, typed up all my prayers from all the week and put them into one. And I'm going to pray it with you right now. I said, Lord, I'm trusting your word. I'm listening to your truth. 
and I'm responding to do your will today. I want to live redemptively, seeking to take people with me to heaven. I want to live hopefully so people see your light reflected out of my life and know you as the God of hope. I want to live fruitfully for you. I want to bear the fruit of the Spirit. I want to redeem the time you give me here on my way to the place you're preparing for me. For Jesus' sake, amen. In the next slide, we have downloadable resources right here at our website, discoverthebook.org. Uh, all the things I mentioned, these verses that I'm memorizing and talk to you about, you can run off copies of those cards. Uh, everything I've talked about, history, the Grace Energized Life, Word-Filled Marriages, are all right there at discoverthebook.org. Uh, two final challenges. Find someone you can share your findings and application prayer with. Don't be solo studying the Bible. Share it with someone. Start a small group. And finally, pray for us. Uh, my wonderful wife, Bonnie, uh, is sitting over there recording. Pray for us as we go. Uh, we're, we're home three weeks, and then we're headed back to the classrooms. Uh, we're going to be in the, the Middle East, uh, working with the refugees. In, uh, uh, in fact, oh, look up. One of the things we're going to do, we're going to a church that actually has people from 21 different countries around the world, all of whom have fled to that country as refugees from all of the different Arab Springs and the wars in, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as the Ukraine, all of those refugees, this church has gone in evangelized in the refugee centers, helped these people get started, and now they're training them in their church. And they've asked for Bonnie and for me to come and minister to the men and the women and to the whole congregation. Okay, before we go, pray for us, but before we go, you, from your study this week, using your notebook, reading the scriptures, find some lessons like I found. Respond to God and say, God, I want to respond to you. Expect scoffers. Resist Satan's lies. Affirm your creator. Remember the judge. And he's watching our lives. And, and he's going to see if our lives will last forever. And so remember that. Escape the fire by by investing in eternal things, seek the Savior, live redemptively. Um, over here, what lasts forever? That should shape my daily life. Are you floating or rowing and resisting and letting God sanctify you? Uh, when it feels like it's the end of the world because of all the possibilities ahead, because God explains the end of everything, he's already told us what we're supposed to do. So here's my challenge. Have a great week in 2 Peter 3. I read 2 Peter 1 and 2 and 3. As long as you're reading it, just add four or five minutes and read the whole book. And ask God to open your eyes to behold wonderful things. Write down all those truths. And then prayerfully invite him to transform your life through it. Thanks for being on week 48 of our 52-week journey through God's word. I can't wait to finish with you all the way through, but take the time this week, work on this every day, write those things down and see God transform your life and then start sharing. And look, I always tell you this, these are on our website also. Uh, there's a whole uh, explanation of how to share gospel tracts to take people with you to heaven. Start living redemptively as we seek to take people with us to heaven. See you next week. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. Mm -hmm.